words, this is the story of Mahidiwia, also known as Buffalo Bird Woman, a Hadatsa Indian woman born about 1840 at the Sakakawea village. This is a dramatized retelling of her life and the ways of the Hadatsa people of the 19th century. Stands of trees and a river border an open area dotted with circular depressions up to 40 feet wide. A woman's long graying hair falls past her shoulders in two thick braids. She gazes out over the sunny landscape. Later, she strolls along the bank of the glassy river. I was born in the Earth Lodge by the mouth of the Knife River, three years after the smallpox winter of 1837. Small ankle, my father named me Mahidiwil, or Buffalo Bird Woman. I do not know why my father chose this name. The spirits of the birds, we thought, had much holy power. I'm still called by the name my father gave me. And as I have lived to be a very old woman, I think it has brought me good luck. She turns away from the bank and walks toward a bowl-shaped depression as a title appears, Mahidiwia, Buffalo Bird Woman. On a map of North Dakota, tributaries join the Missouri River in the western half of the state. The Mandans in my tribe, the Hidatsas, had come years before from the Heart River, and they had built the five villages as we call them, on the banks of the Knife River, near the place where it enters the Missouri. Near the middle of the state, where the Missouri turns south. In a drawing, domed buildings cluster near the bank of the river. The Mandans lived in two of the villages, the Hiradzas in three. We had corn aplenty and buffalo meat to eat in the five villages. And there were old people and little children in every lodge. Rows of depressions above the bank. We Hiradzas lived in earth lodges. Our summer homes were built up here, above the banks of the Knife River. My mother's earth lodge, for the lodge belonged to the woman of the household, was a large one, with the floor measuring more than 40 feet across. We thought an earth lodge was alive and had a spirit like a human body and that its front was like a face with a door for mouth. In the drawing, people sit by support poles inside. These lodges of dirt, grass, and timber were expected to last about 10 years. Our winter camps were made down near the river banks, several miles away from our summer villages. The trees nearby protected us from the cold winter winds and also gave us wood to burn for our fires. The winter lodges were smaller than the summer lodges and not as well constructed. We would very seldom occupy the same winter camp the next year. Many times, floods and enemies destroyed our abandoned winter camps. In a drawing, natives play a game near a cluster of domed lodges. In modern footage, Mahidiwia strolls along the bank Indians do not reckon their kin as white men do. We do not have family names. Instead, each child is born into a clan. A clan is based on a mother's ancestral line. In drawings, men wear their hair long. An Indian calls all members of the mother's clan brother and sister. The members of the father's clan are called the clan fathers and clan aunts. Members of the clan were bound to help each other in need. We thought that the gods would punish us if we did not. A Hiradza woman would turn to members of her clan if she had need of anything. If she was hungry, they gave her food. If her children were naughty, she called on her child's clan father to correct her son a clan aunt to correct her daughter. 
In an illustration, four children gather around a teepee. In another drawing, a man on horseback aims a bow amid a herd of buffalo. The Radza men hunted buffalo and other game. Men were also expected to keep a constant watch out for enemies. Honor and status would be achieved through warfare with enemies and in the many different male societies of the village. A woman sits on the ground amid the poles of a lodge. The woman prepared meals, cleaned the lodges, and raised the children. Moccasins had to be made or old ones mended. Shirts and other garments had to be made. Often there were skins to be dressed and scraped. Leggings and shirts were decorated, usually in winter, when the women had no corn to hoe. Summer was a time to make new baskets of river willows, pottery from river clay, and teepees of tanned buffalo hides. A group watches two boys with spears. Hirata children played many games. For boys, games of war and athletic sport. For girls, housekeeping and games of skill. As the boys grew up, they learned to hunt and defend enemy attacks. A boy carries a quiver of arrows. Girls bring pots to the river's edge. The girls help their mothers with daily chores and in the gardening. They learned at a young age that their roles in life were different. In a reenactment, a sharp stick breaks up soil and hands gather it into a mound. Our gardens were very important. Each family grew enough corn, squash, beans, and sunflowers to last through the winter. Seeds from the best plants were saved to be planted the next year. The women of each lodge had the responsibility for clearing the ground, working the soil, planting, weeding, and harvesting the crops. We would work in our fields nearly every day with our digging sticks and holes made of buffalo shoulder blade bones. We cared for our corn in those days as we cared for a child. For we Indian people love our gardens just as a mother loves her children. And we thought that the corn plants had souls just as children have souls and that the growing corn liked to hear the women in the field sing, as children liked to hear their mothers sing to them. A platform stands about head high. A platform or stage was often built in a garden where the girls and young women of the household came to sit and sing, keeping watch so that birds, horses, or young boys did not steal from or destroy the ripening crop. Mahidiwea peels back the green husk from a foot-long cob of corn. In early August, we harvested selected green ears of corn. Green corn was favorite among all the tribes, either boiled fresh and eaten or dried and stored for the winter. She braids the peeled back husk. The harvest of ripe corn followed several weeks later. When the corn was fully ripened, the owners of the garden went out with baskets, plucked the ears from the stalks, and piled them in a heap ready for the husking. Young men from different social societies helped the women with the work faithfully each day, and when they had husked the corn in one field, they moved to another. In a drawing, a group gathers around baskets piled high with cobs. In earlier times, the mighty buffalo were thick along the Missouri River. Tribal hunters could kill enough buffalo for the winter's store in a single day. Drawings flash past. Riders surround a herd of large buffalo. A rider tumbles backward off his horse. Eventually, the herds move further upstream forcing the hunters to follow them, sometimes for hundreds of miles. Teepees stand in rows. 
large hunting parties would be gone for many weeks at a time. On some parties, hunters and their wives camped together. The men hunted and the women packed the meat for the journey home by bull boat. A couple and dogs ride in a bull-shaped boat. We made the boat frame from willows, covering it with the green hide of a buffalo. In another drawing, posts and sticks make tall platforms. Wrapped bodies lie on top. Smallpox came. More than half of my tribe died in the smallpox winter. Of the man bands, only a few families were left alive. Most of the old people and little children died. A few years later, our chiefs, Mandan and Hidatsa, held a council and decided to move further up the Missouri to a place called Like a Fish Hook Point. I lived there for many years with my husband and my son. Later, we moved further up the river to Independence. A passenger rides on a travoy platform suspended over two posts lashed to a horse. Mahidiwia strolls amid the Earth Lodge depressions. I am one of the last Hidatsas to have lived in the style of the old ways. The sun looms large at the horizon. My people became schooled in the new ways of the white man's society. My son and his children farmed and ranched on the reservation land above the river valley. Mahidiwea watches the river valley from a grassy hill. Sometimes I come here to sit, looking out on the big Missouri near my birthplace. She blinks her dark, wet eyes. In the shadows, I can still see the Indian villages with smoke curling upward from the lodges. And in the river's roar, I hear the yells of the warriors, the laughter of little children as of old. Today, the Mandan, Hidansa, and Erekara live on the Fort Berthel Reservation as the three affiliated tribes. The elders are teaching the young people the old ways that have not been lost. A dancer spins in a costume decorated with fans of feathers. My people have seen much change, both good and bad. With the help of the Creator and His gifts to us, we have survived and will continue to survive if we maintain our respect for the earth. On the hill, Mahidiwea fades and disappears. Credits roll, Mahidiwea portrayed by Grace Henry, NPS Project Supervisor Shirley A. Will, written, produced, and directed by Dana J. Harris, based on Wahini by Gilbert Wilson. Sound design by David Swenson, Native American flute by Kevin Locke, Hadatsa Woman Singing by Nellie Hall, Hidatsa Consultants, Nellie Hall and Gerard Baker. Project Consultants, Mick Holm and Fred Armstrong. Thanks to the people of the three affiliated tribes. Special thanks to Mabel Wonefight and family. All George Catlin artwork, courtesy of National Museum of American Art, Smithsonian Institution, Washington, D.C. All Frederick Wilson artwork, courtesy of Minnesota State Historical Society, St. Paul, Minnesota. All Carl Bodmer artwork, courtesy of Jocelyn Art Museum, Omaha, Nebraska. Presented by National Park Service, U.S. Department of the Interior.